Good morning. Welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday in March and fourth Sunday of Lent. Uh, glad to have all of you here. I have just a few announcements that I want to highlight, um, especially one that I didn't get into the newsletter. Um, the first one I want to mention is that we do have a few soups available from this past Wednesday. Um, if you're interested after church, Isaiah will be back with the basket. Um, and we have some oyster soup and some chicken with rice left over if anybody would like some to take home. Um, and just a reminder with that, that we do have our Wednesday evening service again this week um, with Holden Evening Prayer and a soup supper starting at 6.30. Uh, again, I, uh, the other announcement is most of you noticed coming in, but if you didn't, our newsletters for the month of April are out and available on the tables um, in the parish hall, so please pick yours up. Um, and then the announcement that I wanted to uh, mention that I didn't manage to get into the, the newsletter, but I will get into the bulletin next week. Um, Few people have mentioned that they, they would like to sing one of their favorite hymns, um, or a hymn that they haven't gotten to hear in a very long time. So what we've decided, between Connie and Nathan and myself, we had a conversation and decided through the month of April, there will be a basket um, out in the parish hall. And it will have pencil and paper next to it, and if you have a hymn that is your absolute favorite and we haven't sung it, either because we just haven't in a while, or because it doesn't happen to be in our hymnals, uh, go ahead and write it down. Between Connie and Sarah and Nathan and myself, we probably have just about every hymnal there is. <laughs> um, so if there's a church hymn or a, a hymn from your Sunday school youth that you really want to sing again, we'll have a basket through the whole month of April, and then throughout the month of May, we'll be singing um, people's favorite hymns. Uh, so keep that in mind. I will get that into the bulletin and um, into the announcements in the coming weeks. Uh, I know Murray has an announcement, so I'll... Where do you, there he is. Uh, we've had a pretty exciting week. Thursday uh, we finalized the adoption of the boys. So they are now officially our sons. Uh, <laughs> And we're thrilled to celebrate with you and welcome the boys officially as men's boys now. And um, Robert is Boyd Mentz, correct? And then, um, and so we are, we're thrilled that that has finally, after a long time, come to fruition. So wonderful news. Um, are there other announcements this morning? Say. 
Joyce told me that was in the newsletter, okay. so we're good. <laughs> right. This is kind of a pastor, Matt. Are you going to mention this? Oh, it's going to be good. Uh, you you going to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> or I will. So 115 in Melvin, if you can haul part of the ramp, that would be excellent. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? All right, then I have one. Oh, sorry. to our prayer list today, um, we add the family of Ginny Miller. Um, Pat said people from Chatsworth especially would know her, um, but so she had fallen a little while ago and she um, did uh, pass away this just yesterday? Last night. Last night. Um, so we pray for her family in this time. Um, are there any other additions or updates for our prayer list this morning? Okay, oh, before I forget, <laughs> We didn't realize we were a little short on confession on Lenten handouts. So really quick, if you don't happen to have a confession and forgiveness or Lenten litany insert in your bulletin, um, Matt has a few extras in the back. So if you just kind of you know lift your hand or Irv has some, he'll be happy to give you. Um, I, re I realized the pile looked shallow and then I forgot about it and bulletins were already handed out. So if you don't have an insert, there are some extras available. All right, are we good? All right, then let us uh, invite you to stand as we begin our worship with our Lenten confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who gathers us in the wilderness to redeem us, anoint us, and make us new. Amen. In these 40 days, let us be honest, confess our sin, and receive God's promise of mercy. God at the margins, we have wandered far from your home. Again and again, we lose our way. We turn inward, afraid of the world around us. We forget that you have saved your people before and promise to do so again. Do not remember the deeds of our past, but turn our faces toward the future, where your forgiveness is sure, your welcome is clear, and your love overflows. Amen. Like, again, like a hen who gathers her chicks, God embraces you in tender care. Like manna in the desert, 
God feeds you with surprising mercy. Like a loving parent, God runs to meet you again this day, forgiving your sins for the sake of Christ and leading you from death into life. Amen. We turn to our Lenten, Lenten litany. O God, you are the source of our hope. God us through change and chance. When we grow weary and faint, call our hearts to be your own. When our plans fall to dust, be our temple and our tower. When the world lacks joy and beauty, Reveal your splendor, light, and life. O oh God, we praise you for the gift of your Son. Strengthen us to follow the way of the cross. Passion. You welcome the wayward, 
and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace, and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you to the disgrace of Egypt, and so that is called Gilgal to this day, while the Israelites were camped in Gilgal. They kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho on the day after the Passover. On that very day, they ate produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna seized on the day they ate produce of the land and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year.
The psalm is Psalm 32, tone 9. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord gives no guilt, and in his spirit there is no God. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me today and night. My moisture was dried up as in the deep of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore all the faithful will make their prayers to you in a time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble, and you surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with brit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are of true of heart. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, see, and everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are our ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. Here ends the second reading. I invite the young people forward. Well, good morning. good things. But for children's sermon this morning, I have a job for you to do. Okay. Oh, well, see, okay. So, so what I have, I'll show them so they can know. I have one of those fill in the blank statements, right? Okay. God, something, me. Okay. So what I'm going to ask you is to fill in the blank. I know several of you have ideas, so just shout out what you think it is. Oh, wait, I thought we all knew what the answer was. I heard several different. Okay, all right, so let me start. Okay, you said, okay, so Corbin says the answer should be loves me. I heard something else. What did somebody else say down here? Huh? Helps me, all right. Created me, all right. What else? God and me. I gotcha. All right. Any others? Is with, all right. Huh? Always with us, all right. All right, did you say God in me? Is that what I heard? No, okay. in, in me, okay. All right, so part of, see, we've got a lot of answers for this one. Just out of curiosity, should we ask them what they think to go there? Okay, God, oh wait, you got another one, Jameson? What is it? <clears throat> Watches me, that's all right. All right, I'll turn it this way so you guys know what answers have already been given. All right? No, I don't think I can write upside down. We'll try, all right. Knows me. <laughs> You're not leaving anything for the adults. I love it. What? <laughs> Okay, everywhere, how about we go everywhere with me? How about that, since we've got... 
What's Skylar? God, God always does. Okay, all right. So it's everywhere with us. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Let me see if they have. Do we have do we have anything else they haven't said that you've got some Celeste? Believes in me. Absolutely. All right. Isaiah, do I see your hand? No. Yours was a joke. You can tell me that later. <laughs> Mason. Saves me. Anybody else? Oh, okay, all right. Forgives me. Celeste, you have another one? Cares for me. Sends. Oh, wait. Sends. Sends me. Oh, excellent. You guys listen. I love it. <laughs> Alex. Judges me. Oh, that's an interesting one. Right? We get that sense from what the Bible says, don't we? Corbin. Trust me. Jameson. Made me. I'm still looking for one more that maybe um, Becky could give me. And she thinks for long and hard enough. <laughs> Look at her put her on the spot. Oh, there we go. Teaches me. Oh, you see where I was going there? Isaiah. Yep, we got saves. Yep, that's a good one. Um, Celeste? Walks with me. We're filling up the board here. Always by your side. Yep, that's right. We got that. Yep, always with us. Connie? Heals. Heals me. We got a lot of them here, huh? Yeah, watches. Yep, watch it. Yep, do we have, yep. I thought we had watches. There we go, watches. Yep. How about, I'm going to throw one on there. Guides me. <laughs> Inspires me. I love it. That's a lot. Look at that. You almost filled up our entire board. When, when I first showed that to you, everybody went, oh, I know what the answer is. There, there is more space, and we could keep going, right? We could. He, yep, we got, yep, saves. We're saves. Right down there, yep. It's amazing. We, if we sit here all day, we could come up with enough words to probably fill this board and probably another board and another board and another board. Today, our gospel is a parable. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. Have you heard the word parable before? Do you know what it means? <laughs> no. A parable is a story that has a meaning to it. There's a point to telling the story. It's not just like a, hey, I was going to the grocery store and it was really cool and I got chocolate, yay. Right? It's a story that's told for a specific purpose. And our story today, the parable that Jesus tells, is the prodigal son. Right? You might have heard this story before. A father that has two sons, one that runs away, one that stays behind. And the story ensues about how the father reacts to the different brothers, how the brothers react to each other. And a lot of times we hear a story like that and we go, oh, I know what that's supposed to be. But one of the things that God does when, when Jesus tells those stories, one of the things that happens is it turns out it can mean all these different things. God has a lot to tell us about his relationship with us. Right? And I love that these are all the words we started to hear when we thought about God and me. When we think about God and us, we think about absolutely love. That's the number one thing we think about. God loves us. But even when there are times that we don't, we, we aren't sure, we don't necessarily feel that love, sometimes God teaches us. Sometimes God watches over us. Right? Sometimes we remember that he created us when we are his children, that he's with us, that he forgives us, that he heals us. All these wonderful things. They're what? So, yeah, he absolutely, he saved us. And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put one more on there. God understands me. God blesses me, definitely. God knows how we are. In the, in the stories that Jesus tells us, we hear about ourselves, both the good and the bad. God says, I understand you. 
And I forgive you when you mess up. And I send you to do greater things. And I watch over you. And I'm a part of you. And I help you. And most of all, I love you. Right? I love that that's the first thing that came to our mind. God loves us. He understands us. He knows us. All of these things are a part of our story with God. It doesn't have to be just one thing. It is many things, depending on what's going on in our life and how we feel and how others treat us. All of those things play into what God reminds us about our relationship with him. God is all of these things and so much more to us. What a blessing that God interacts with us in everything we do, in every way we act, in every part of our story, God is there. Let us have a prayer. God, you mean so many things to us. And we thank you that first and foremost, you mean love to us. That we always, always can take with us the knowledge that we are loved, no matter where we are in our story. We thank you for the gift of these stories that help us to know you better. And we thank you especially for your son who taught them to us and who gave his life for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Gospel according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. 
But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, over the years, I have approached this parable from a lot of different perspectives, as I'm sure we all have. Haven't we all taken time to imagine being that father dealing with ungrateful children, ending unending worry, and then great joy? Or perhaps we've been the young son, convinced in his desire to go somewhere else, explore the world, demanding his share, then suffering and starving and humbling himself to find unending love given. And of course, we get the older son, steady, reliable, jealous and pouty, just as selfish as the younger in his own way, and desiring unending attention. Time and again, these are the three players in the story that we think about, think like, think of. But there is a fourth in the story who gets overlooked. And today, I have to wonder just how he felt about his role. His appearance is brief. His words, few. But what he expected and what he got were two very different things. Did you notice him in the story? Most of us don't. He's a slave. He's not terribly consequential to the entire story, with the exception that he bears great news. Your brother has returned safe and sound. It's a party. Come on, let's go. What could be better news than a celebration? A lost family member returned. The slave expected a joyful reaction, a happy reunion, a relieved sigh. Thank goodness he's home. Some sign that the brother understood what good news was being given. And instead, he got anger, frustration, a stubborn child who refused to go in to the party. That poor guy. How could anyone not hear the good news he brought? Your loved one, safe and sound. Has it ever happened to you where you knew what you were saying ought to be taken as good news, but the one hearing it didn't take it that way? It often ha happens at moments like the parable today where there's a tense and grieving family, a moment where our best and our worst qualities shine through. I hear it a lot at funerals, where you know someone has something to share that is meant to sound like good news. I've heard one too many times, I guess God needed another angel. But what is heard could be, God killed my loved one just to have him sooner? Mainly it happens when we don't know what to say. And rather than silence, we say the first thing we think of or what we think the other person wants to hear. For lack of better words, we dumb down the good news into platitudes that may comfort us, but do little to help those we are speaking to. For instance, for someone who is struggling to make it through each and every day, let go and let God <coughs> may be less helpful than what can I do to help. 
For a person battling illness or grief, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger may encourage you. But they are facing the very real possibility of what feels like being killed. And don't even get me started on love the sinner, hate the sin. Because we reserve that phrase for other people, not ourselves, and we presume what sin is and how to fix it. Our good news does not always sound like good news to those who are hearing it. Your brother, who wasted half of your dad's fortune, is here and they're celebrating it. Is it the message or the messenger? It's an important question to ask in the church, in our hearts, in our words, and on our deeds. In our confession this Lent, we say the words and hear the words, let us be honest. So let us be honest. In this parable, what do we hear as the good news? Do we rejoice in the news that we see, uh, those we see as trouble, trash, wastrels, heathens, different, uncomfortable, annoying, brash, racist, bigoted, homophobic, over the top, need I go on? Do we rejoice in the news that God runs to welcome them as surely as he welcomes the faithful, upstanding, tax-paying, law-keeping, law-abiding, umpteenth generation, normal, good person? Or do we grumble about fairness, time served, judgment, and bitterness? And how does our behavior cause others to react to God's good news that we proclaim we live when our good news doesn't seem to be for everyone? My brother, your son, who wasted everything, and you rejoice. Let us be honest. As hard as it is to hear sometimes, and as hard as it may be to live, the parable tells us that God's good news is for every one. So it may not always sound like the world's good news. The father rushes to meet his wild child. Not to judge, not to condemn, not to demand explanation or to punish, but solely to embrace him. And then the father goes out to the older brother, not to chastise him or correct him, to judge or condemn him, but to welcome him to the celebration. His words of good news are simple, and they neither demand nor excuse. They simply state fact. He was dead, and now he lives. He was lost and now is found. That is good news that reaches beyond all platitudes, all awkward silences, all the demands, all the fear, all the unknowns, and it speaks to every one of us. We were dead. Whether our deaths came through foolishness or illness or a long-lived life, we are still dead. But through Christ's love and actions, we have been made alive again. Handed forgiveness, grace, compassion, and love we don't deserve and can never earn. We were lost. Be it on the path to debauchery, selfishness, struggle, confusion, or standing in a field seeing everyone else's sticks left around while ignoring the blog that's miring us down in self-righteousness. We were lost. But because God sought each of us out, we are found. And a celebration is happening. What good news! We are found and alive. Found and alive. God doesn't try to give us all the answers for things we cannot explain. 
He doesn't make us the judge of those who wander off, which, by the way, is all of us. And he doesn't belittle all those who have kept closer than others. He definitely doesn't keep his life and his love from any of his children. God tells us time and again, we are alive and we are found. What wondrous love is that? The message of good news God would have us take to the world. Place in our hearts. Carry with us always is good news full of promise and forgiveness. Grace and love. No one is beyond the Father's embrace. In him we are found <coughs> and alive. Found and alive. Amen. our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in
doing? Pretty good. Well, great. Peace, 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 Peace. Congratulations. I didn't know this was the week.
Now, seeking the grace, mercy, and love of Almighty God, we offer our prayers for the church, for people in need, and for all of creation. God of abundant grace, guide your church to look upon people as you look upon them, with compassion and as deserving of love and mercy. Shape us to be worthy ambassadors of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, God of abundant hope, bestow dignity on migrant and seasonal farm and factory workers. When the time comes for them to leave jobs, provide new ways for them to make a livelihood. Watch over those who work every day only to fall short of their needs, and keep us mindful of our attitudes towards those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of abundant mercy, change the hearts of those who bully or mistreat others and help them to repent of their actions. Watch over especially this day our brothers and sisters in the transgender community who strive every day to be understood and loved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of abundant love, protect and preserve all people who look to you to be their hiding place. Be their respite from trouble and give them hope. Watch over all who are sick and grieving. We remember especially Martin and Irene, Dixie, Lee, Julia, Marilyn, Don, Melissa, Tim, Pat, Pauline, Steve, Pam, Marcia, Brayden, Susan, Irma, Doug, John, Steve, Pat, Mandy, Vicky, Susan, Marge, Brendan, Brenda, the Miller family, and all those who rest in our hearts and our minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of abundant life, invite your whole community of saints into eternal and joyful feasting. When we question your abundant mercy, soften our, soften our hearts to receive the gifts of faith and love. And when we die to this earth, make us alive again in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reveal your will as you receive our prayers and conform our ways to your ways. Through the saving work of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.